Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is about visiting Steve and Alex from Acorn to Arabella and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. Steve and Alex have been building their own timber boat from scratch for about four years now, so I decided to swing by and check it out. <laughs> I get my viewpoint right. Uh, this is Alex, and he's one of the two. Steve and Alex are the two sort of head project guys for Arabella, or building Arabella, which is Acorn to Arabella. Yep. I'll put a link in the description to their YouTube channel, and uh, my first time tying the boat in the flesh, so it what is. have we got? Yes. Uh, it's an Atkin Ingrid, so mm -hmm. William Atkin designed this boat in 1934. Yep. Um, we basically got the plans off yep. of Pat nice. Atkin off the website. She yeah. should be good. It's a double ender. Um, they are basically designed off of the Colin Archer designs from Norway. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, they were basically the boats that used to go out in rough storms to go and rescue right. fishermen. So oh, okay. Should be a perfect adventuring boat for us. <laughs> <laughs> and the plan is to? Uh, the plan when she's built yeah. is basically to sail the world. Right. Um, nice. We're both adventurers. Uh, we yeah. like rock climbing and all that kind of stuff. Yes, so yeah. the plan is to basically do that all around the world. And when Alex says both, Steve's hiding over here, who you normally <laughs> see in front of the camera. So uh, these are the guys. So you've been at it four years? Four years in January. Four years in January. And do you feel like, uh, you know, you've turned a corner now where doing your planking feels like you're, you know, you're starting to see a boat emerge or does it feel like it's sort of steady as she goes? It's kind of on and off. I yeah. mean, looking at these, you can kind of see the shape now. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Looking a lot Motivating nicer, or, but mm. it kind of seems like we get a good head of steam and then it kind of seems to like... Right, okay. Something comes up, like we need to wait on something to come yes. or something yeah. else that we need to work on or we need help with. Or, so there's but, just a lull where you can't progress. Yeah. And do you find there's many things you can do in parallel or there's a whole lot of prerequisites because you just go, I cannot do this until this is done? And Normally, there's a lot of stuff that we can do at the same time. Yeah, cool. Um, Right now, we've kind of come up to a point where that's not really the case. Right, okay. And uh, what's the next step for you guys now? So you're doing rudder? Prop shaft stuff. Oh, prop shaft, right. Yeah, okay. so before we cover up the stern post and planking, yeah. we want to get the prop shaft board yeah. and get all of that set up. Um, and since it's timber and timber moves, yes. um, we want to drill the shaft and then bore it out to size and put a liner in it mm -hmm. in very quick succession. Gotcha, yeah. Um, so Joe, the guy who's been helping us out with the machining, mm -hmm. is working on that. Yep. We've been doing that with him the last few days. So as soon as the liner's done and the inner attachment for the stuffing box is done yep. and the outer cutlass bearing is done, right. then we'll drill, we'll bore, we'll put the sleeve in, yep. and then um, we get right back to planking. Right, okay. But once that's done, we're just going to be planking for you know, probably the next two months. Oh, okay. It's just yep. going to be every day, come out and but try to get a plank on. But uh, compared to four years, that'll be an amazing two months, though. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> very Indeed. exciting. You'll start to see a boat emerge. Yeah, well. and the thing with the stuffing boxes is, I mean, especially for us wanting to voyage and go to remote places, yes. we can bring an extra cutlass bearing yep. to slide into the stern cutlass. Yeah, yeah. And we can bring an extra stuffing box. Yep. And we can literally, especially since she's not a fin keel, mm -hmm. we could put her on a beach somewhere yeah. and Carina in and one just, tide yeah. change, slide out the shaft, put in a new bearing, put in a new packing Perfect. and be back yeah. off. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of that too. Just the, the idea that uh, this is not a day cruise around a boat and suddenly you're back in the slipway. Yeah, when no. you go, having really critical spares with you and you could be at an island with nothing on it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yep. and as long as you can find a suitable beach, as you say. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah, a good so a lot of the stuff that we're doing actually takes that in mind. Yes, yeah, uh, right from the build phase, oh, yes, yeah. exactly. Yep. Yeah, Yeah, when you've got some bespoke part, and I can only get that from XYZ supplier who don't FedEx to yep. a deserted island. <laughs> <laughs> it's more difficult. And so I heard in one of you're not um, super experienced sailors, <laughs> you know, the world's not as scary place as people perhaps believe. No. You know, yeah. just go for it. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever seen Chasing Bubbles? No. No, you should check that okay. out. Okay, yeah. So this guy, um, who's his name, is Russ? Yeah. He uh, goes down to the Bahamas, basically, yep. buys a little boat, yep. bangs around the Bahamas for a season, yep. sells the boat, buys a bigger boat, yeah, takes right. it around the world. Yeah, nice. And they're Done. like out on their first sail in a storm, and he's down below reading like, you know, how to sail in a storm for yes. dummies. Oh, I think there is this, this one classic textbook, apparently. It's the definitive book on on weathering a storm out. I'll have to get oh, a yeah. copy and 
And I'll, I'll definitely read it with the storm hits, not before. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, people with virtually no experience at all have They've done that jumped much. on boats yep. and gone. And yep. And the thing for us too is like everybody assumes that we're going to build her, put her on the water, and try to sail away. Yes. But for us, it's like we'll put her in the water. We yep. have a ton of friends that sail. Exactly. We'll take a season. We'll learn how to sail. We'll take it easy. And I've been learning all about this uh, like intra good... coastal waterway down the US as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, and was the great circle you do the Mississippi, then back up the. Yeah. yeah. You go. There's four thousand miles of sailing you can do before you go out in the ocean. Even it's amazing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, but it is funny, like you say, people sort of presume you're going to do something. Yeah. <laughs> daft when you just go, mm -hmm. and we've come this far. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think we've got it. You know, <laughs> we can figure out how to build it. We've we both got to figure out how to sail it. Exactly, <laughs> that's right. All right, enough yakking. Uh, Alex and Steve are now going to give us a bit of a tour around the boat. So, this is our four and a half ton lead ballast keel. Oh, wow. And that was like our first really huge hurdle. Yeah. Um, so there's everything from two ounce battery terminals that yep. friends dropped off <laughs> up to three or four different sailboat keels. Right, um, added That in. ended up being our biggest source, source of sailboat keels. Sailboats, there's a few yeah. thousand pounds of wheel weights in there. Yes. Um, but we melted that down in a 200 gallon air compressor with a roaring fire around it and then dumped almost 100 gallons of molten lead wow. into a wooden mold buried in the ground. Yep. And out came our ballast keel. Beautiful. Um, and then that's held on to our wood keel here with these pocket bolts. So there's a one inch bronze bolt that's in here. And goes oh, through the so you can just access the, the head, head of the bolt through the pocket. Through the pockets. Yep. Yep. And that's what locks that on. And then uh, the keel timber here is one piece of white oak that is 25 feet long, yep. 10 inches thick and 16 inches wide. Wow. And it's clear of the heart and it's clear of the sap. Wow. So that came out of half the diameter of the, the tree, tree, less than half. Yeah. Um, so it's the only piece of timber for the boat that we've purchased. Right, okay, um, yep. So that was harvested in upstate New York and yep. then trucked to Connecticut and milled and we bought it off Duke from New England Naval Timbers. But all the other timber for the boat, um, we either cut it here on the property or we cut it off local properties from people who donated yeah. the timber. Um, so, so far, the keel timber is the only piece of wood that oh, we've bought. Yeah. Which oh, is excellent. really amazing. And everything's come, all the timbers come about 100 miles to get here. Yeah, right. Uh, at most. At most, yeah. Which is really cool. It's very much a local boat. So, I guess that's the origin of the name of the channel? Yeah. Yeah. Acorn Dirabella, yep. Um, yeah, and then the stem and the stern are laminated white oak. Mm -hmm. So we took timbers from the property and laminated them up with resource and all, and then yes, put right. those together. And so the choice to use resource and all rather than epoxy or something was for the traditional aspect, or it's got properties you prefer? Or? Yeah, it's properties we prefer. So yeah. it's funny, people think that we're building a traditional timber boat, yeah. and that we're really stuck on the traditional yeah, aspect yeah, of yeah. it, and that's, that's not so not the much case. the case. Okay. Um, so oak and epoxy have a really tricky history together. Okay. Um, so oak is closed poured, mm -hmm. so it doesn't absorb the doesn't epoxy absorb, at all, right. it doesn't penetrate, and it's really oily, Yep. and it also is loaded with tannins. Mm -hmm. And all of those things make it a very difficult wood to glue. Okay. Um, so they have more modern epoxies that are supposed to work really well with oak, mm -hmm. but none of them have really been in existence longer than like 10 years. Right, okay. And for a boat that we hope is gonna last 100 or more, there's no proof that it's going to... It's not real yeah. long proof. Where resource and all and oak have a very long, long very history, proven yeah. history together. Right. And the only thing with resource and all is you need to measure it by weight. Yes, okay, um, for the mixing so ratio. It's a little bit more finicky in that, yeah. is that you need a very accurate scale and you need to pay attention to that. Yeah. Um, and you also need very tight glue joints. So right. the gap, no gap filling, filling resource and all is gap filling to a 16th of an inch. Right, okay. Um, so you need to have fairly tight tolerances. Yeah. The upswing is you can't overclamp it. Right, it okay. It loves high clamping pressure. Right, okay. So for us, we're very capable of making joints that are a 32nd or better. Better, yeah. And we can throw on a whole bunch of clamps and just clamp the living daylights out of it yeah. and not worry about it. Um, it's also boil proof and chemical resistant right. and heat resistant. Yeah. So, and it's about the same price as epoxy. Right. So, so I think if we were working with more like Douglas fir or spruce or some other timber that mm -hmm. epoxied really well, mm -hmm. we would probably use it. Okay. Yep. Um, but just because it's the oak and... So it was an entirely practical, pragmatic decision, nothing, uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, no nostalgia. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> um, same reason for the bronze is... Uh, 
steel and oak aren't really the best of friends and it's right. because of the tannins and the oak. okay yeah. um so we could put galvanized or um not galvanized but stainless steel fasteners in yes but the bronze is going to behave even better with the oak in the long run than the stainless right, okay, yep, will yep um so hence the bronze and the bronze you welded yeah so that is silicon bronze welded with aluminum bronze and those are fabricated bronze floors so we just bought plate and cut it and bent it and welded it and fabricated the floors so there's 37 38 floors something yeah. like that and yeah. every single one of them is unique and then these are our steam bent frames oh right yes so those are all originally very straight pieces of oak when we started yep um and then we steamed them for about two hours and bent them into place and so some is steam bent and some is cut from a slab of timber to be yeah, so almost all the frames in the boat are bent, except for three in the stem and three in the stern. Right. And those are the sawn frames. Right. And the reason for that is they don't have a lot of shape, so they don't have crazy curves to them, um, but they have a lot of shape fore and aft. So to get these bent frames to twist like that, ah yes, they end up leaning for or aft, and they keep they make the spacing hard. So it becomes um, a compound bend in it. And, yeah. yeah. So for those ones up in the seven stern, it's easier just to saw them. Yep. Is this stuff you've been learning as you go, or from a previous trade, or all of the above? Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, I grew up here on the farm, so I'm fifth generation. Yeah. Um, so like my grandfather cut down all the trees and milled yeah. the lumber and built right. his house and built the barn and we've restored tractors and done yes. all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I learned a lot from that. And then Absolutely, yeah. everything boat building specific is all completely self-taught. Right, yes. So I've from just, this boat. This is your first boat? Yeah. Yep. So I've just read a lot of books. Yeah. Pretty much. There's so much information out there these days. Yep. You should look on YouTube. There's stuff there too. <laughs> you know, honestly, I... I don't find watching the videos for me personally yeah. Um, yeah. to be the best way. Like I yeah. really like to sit down and read, and read. the text. And yeah. I absorb it really well. And yeah. If I sit down and read a book once or twice, I can mm. regurgitate it pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. We are by no means the authority of boat building. Sure. Yeah. But the hope is that we can. You can go from zero. You can watch the videos and you understand. Like, oh, okay, conceptually, I get how a wooden boat is built. Yeah. I understand some of these terms. I understand kind of the general principles of it. Now you can go pick up Bud McIntosh's book or Larry Parday's book mm -hmm. and read it and have a general understanding and hopefully be able to, like I said, like bridge that gap yeah. and make it more understandable for folks and more attainable and there's also something about just actually seeing the work be done as opposed to seeing uh, drawings or pictures absolutely or yeah so i like this so these are quite nice and i really appreciate you letting yeah. me have a go as well like, <laughs> <laughs> so you put battens on to kind of get your fairing for your ribs is that what what this is about yeah so you, you make the molds yep and these are all temporary Oh, okay. So these are all coming out. Wow. Um, so people see them with the knots and the bark. Yeah. And okay. They freak out. Yes. Yeah. They'll all become firewood eventually. Right. Okay. Um, but you need those to basically create the basket that you then bend the frames to. Right. Gotcha. So you put the molds up and you spring the ribbons around them, and then that gives you something to bend all of your frames to. to. Gotcha. And then you can put the planks on. And these bent frames, they're all clamped at the top, so they don't really move much now. But mm -hmm. if you were to go and unclamp them, you can push them in and out. Okay. Yeah, they, they have, and you can push them yeah, fore and right. aft, and they've got a bit of give to them. Not so much down here, yeah. um, but up here, definitely. Up here, definitely yeah. And that's why we still have the molds in. Right. So basically, you wrap the planking around the boat, yep. and then once all the planking's fastened to all the frames, and all the bevels are cut, and everything's cocked and interlocked, Yeah. You can pop out the molds. You can't go anywhere, yeah. It's not going to move. And so these all got lofted off your plans by yep. a table of offset type thing? or yep. yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, that was quite the learning curve as well. Yeah, right. Yeah. Doing that for the first time. And having a couple of sets no of eyes because getting on. a number wrong. Although normally you kind of see, you go, all right, well, why do I have all these dots and then one yep. here? So it's like yeah. obviously wrong, but... I think the biggest thing with lofting for us is 
it made so much more sense once we actually started doing yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Like you read about loft and you're like, all right, you lay down a grid. Okay, you plot these points, and then you it start talking about the comparing space. the three views, and everything goes off the rails. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so starting the loft was really kind of intimidating in yeah. that way. But once we started doing the process, mm -hmm. and we started laying down the lines, we're like, oh, okay, once you can I see, it, I see yeah. how all this starts to play in. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. And now I think if we went and lofted the boat. I think, I mean, it took us weeks, and I think yeah. that would take us days. I think that is I, the thing. Like, completely different. When, you, when you're not an expert at something, I do believe a lot of the time you can achieve the same result. It just takes you a lot longer. Yes. So yes. when people say, oh, I build a boat, would, it would be a terrible boat. You know, it won't be a terrible boat. It would just take you seven years to build it, not two years or something. But the end result can be just as good as a, mm -hmm. okay, may, may, you know, maybe minor differences, but it'll certainly be a boat you can be proud of and a boat you can safely sail on yeah. your journey. You know, it can it be, and it all depends on, you know, what your skills are. But yes. Definitely. I mean, the understanding part takes a little bit more, but mm. you can definitely do it. I mean, mm. We had no idea before we started. Yes. This. We had carpentry skills, but that was Yes, exactly. It. Yes. <laughs> but the other yeah. thing is we have the luxury of time. Right. Yes. yes. So we're like, a, if we were to go contract to have this boat built, yes. <laughs> and we yeah. said, we want you to custom fabricate bronze floors for every frame, mm -hmm. you would either pay out the nose, yeah. or they would laugh at you and yes. say, no, you can't get it done. But you know, we can take three you months to make it. bronze mm -hmm. boards. And that is where a, a DIY anything, boat building, whatever you want to do, um, can often actually end up with a better result than a commercial yes. offering because corners get cut and um, it's just prohibitively expensive to have yeah. what you can do for yourself. Well, commercial things too, basically what they're doing is they're taking the average of what you need. Yes. So like when we were doing, what yeah. we're working on now is the shaft assembly mm -hmm. and like the piece that goes on the inside they're at a 90 degree angle. Mm -hmm. Your stern post is at a 90 degree angle. Yeah, so right. Basically, you have to cut that out. Yes. So for us, we're like, well, we're not doing that. So we might as well make our own and yeah. it'll fit perfectly and yeah. the structural integrity will be better. Yes. It's the yes. Same thing with all the floors and. Copper rivets for us are a big example yeah. of that. So in most bent frame boats in the United States, people screw fasten them now. Okay, yep. Um, and the reason for that really to my understanding is that it's faster. It's faster and cheaper. And it's cheaper. Yeah. But what happens is these are split. So you put your screw through your plank and mm -hmm. you just put it through your first part of your frame. Yeah. You don't want it sticking out on the inside. Yeah, and so it doesn't it have any clamping force, does it? somewhere in your just second short. frame. Yeah. And I don't think it's quite as great for locking that all together. No. Where if you put a rivet through it, it's basically a through bolt. Mm. Yeah. And it locks those two parts of the frames together. And so if there's any gap between those two parts of the frame, a screw, if it's all thread, it won't it won't close them won't close the, the rivet will the when you will it. exactly yeah and you yeah. can always go through and head the rivets again yeah. and snug yeah, them back up over time yep. which is really hard to do with the screws so so we decided to, to do the rivet fastening and mm -hmm. we looked at what's available commercially nowadays for copper mm -hmm. rivets and they're all really small right because people are using them on small boats and yes. small projects and yeah. anybody building a boat like this they're using screw fastenings yeah okay yeah. Um, so we ended up just making our own. Yeah, the mainstream just doesn't support you in some ways, does yeah. it? Yeah. So we have bigger and better rivets than we ever could have bought, yep. and we have them cheaper. Yeah, and, and no production, uh, well not even production boat, even commercial boat building company is going to do that. Would do that? No. 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 They would just tell you, we're going to screw fasten it, and screw fastenings are fine, and they are fine. Yeah. But I, I think the rivets are better. Hmm. Oh, that's it. Exactly. Yep. And you know, and if you can, and you can cheaper. Yeah, You're crazy not to. Yeah. 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 So nice. these are the most ridiculous bronze fabrications we've done so far. Oh, lovely. And those are to hold up the engine beds. Wow, that's great. And that's what these big blocks of timber are. Those are three by four inch block locusts. Ah, which is the it's really hard, really dense, really rock yeah. resistant. Yeah. Oh, nice. And those are to have two bolts, two half inch bronze bolts at uh, every um, frame. Right. And uh, 11 four foot beam displaces or drafts five foot six, and will displace about 25,000 pounds dry and empty. Okay, so she's a heavy girl. So for me, it's like 12 tons, I guess. Is that right? 25,000 pounds, about about double, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So mine's is a shorter steel boat, uh, nine and a half tons. So. Similar weight. I, I wish I'd gone, and I'll probably have to go and do another boat because of this, but uh, 30 foot I think is a little bit too short. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think 37, like there's just every foot 
you gain as a boat goes on gives you a lot more living space. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot more work too. Lives, yes, sure. sure. It's a lot more paint. Well, it's a lot more everything. <laughs> it, it is in some ways, but at the same time, it's still one engine, one rudder, one prop, yeah. one wheelhouse. So yeah. I agree, it's more work, but um, it's uh, it's not proportionally more to the entire project. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. With Victoria, because we had Victoria out front earlier, and uh, she's an and Eric. Which right. Is basically the little brother, little sister, whatever yeah. you want to call it, to the Ingrid. Yes. Um, and that boat was six feet shorter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you go inside and you look and it's it's a dramatic amount it of is. space. Yeah. You know, narrower beam, less yeah. you know, like just beam's everything. Almost the same. Oh, is it a Yeah, yeah it's really interesting. Similar. Just okay. like cup four inches I think in the beam. Yeah. So this will be a bit quicker then as well. Yep. In mm -hmm. the water, which is always nice when you're doing ocean crossings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not that you're in a rush, but you yeah. know, if you're trying to beat a storm or something, it's yeah, she won't be a particularly fast boat, but no. she won't be a slow boat. No, 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 that's it. And look, to be honest with you, there's two arguments. There's a boat can be light and quick and beat the storm, yep. or it can be strong enough to weather the storm. And I don't know, I don't think it's personal taste, what you want to do. Yeah, well, I would no, personally go a stronger boat that over. Now too, is like most people nowadays are getting, you know, fast, light yeah. um, fiberglass boats mm -hmm. and they just pay attention to the weather and yeah. stay out of it. She won't need that. No, I won't need to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know which hatches. Let's go down and make some soup. <laughs> exactly. I think you've gone the right way. Yeah. Because that's a really nice theory until the one day something goes wrong mm -hmm. and you're stuck. Exactly. You know? Well, yeah. yeah. You lose electricity and you lose your nav. Yes. Yeah. All yeah. you need to do is get caught in a lightning storm. Something has to happen and, and you'd like <laughs> all that wonderful plan I had to be back in harbour by tomorrow morning is gone out the window. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh... You know, the ocean's not a predictable place to be. No. So I think you've made the right choice, definitely. And for us, I mean, we high in northern latitudes hold a lot of appeal. Yeah. Right, okay. So Baffin Island, Fjords of Norway, right, yes. Patagonia, yeah. northern Japan, like these yeah. are all places we would like to go. Yeah. Alaska. No Northwest Passage crossing. Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you know, Actually, no. that's been, it's been talked about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for a lot of those places, you know, the weather forecasting is not as amazing as it is right, for okay, yep. other developed places. Capital cities and, and, yep, and yep. weather becomes a bit mm. more unpredictable when you're up in the mountains and farther north and southern latitudes. Yes, yep. So. Yep. No, it's definitely uh, Brewpeg's challenge too, because they're very keen to get into the ice. So Yeah. Yeah. And I guess you guys, you know, they've, they've done a lot of insulating because of the steel boat, where you've sort of got this natural insulation of the timber boat as yeah, well. Yeah, you should be pretty good in that yeah, regard. Yeah, nice, yeah. yeah. And then we've got a beautiful little wood stove to put in there. Nice. So, very fine. nice. There's lots of wood to burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep your station molds. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll go with your station numbers. Yep. So the top ribbon is the shear. Yep. Oh, okay. So everything above that will eventually get lopped off. Yep. Just having... Um, the frame's taller, makes bending them a little easier. Exactly, but gives you the leverage. Still a bit of flex there, yep. They move, even clamped. Not, not these. It's on. Yes. <laughs> the biggest commercial available rivet we could find is round, mm -hmm. um, and not that large diameter. So we ended up buying this quarter inch square stock in 12 foot runs, yep. cutting it down to length, and then with the help from Joe, the machinist, we made this rig. So you slide those in, and then the bolts get tightened down, mm -hmm. and this cap goes on. And the cap is important because what we found is when the pins go down, the bronze or the copper stands too high and it just wants to fall over. Uh, okay. It doesn't actually form the head. The head of it. So yeah. this guides it and that really helps it form that head. And then up under here, there's just four pins ah, right. that register into the holes. And then um, don't get spooked, it's going to yep. make some noise. It's hooked up to the air compressor. So yep. you, and it drops down and they'll press the four heads and then pop it down, pop the cap out, pop four more in. Mm -hmm. And this is what you end up with. Yeah. Up with. Yep. Nice. Much stronger than anything you can buy. Yeah, so they're larger diameter than the round ones. But the other nice thing is, is if you think about this, when they go into the boat, we're not going to really pay attention to where the triangles are pointing, mm -hmm. right? You're just going to grab the nail and you're just going to hammer it in the boat. So they're going to end up at all of these different, different angles. Different angles, yeah. So no matter how you load the hull or the planking, yep. you're always trying to bend a substantial number of copper rivets. Yeah 
across their axis. So a and if you take a round it. bar and you try to bend it, yep. and then you take a square bar and you try to bend it across those axes, Diagonal. they are so much stronger and yeah. so much more resistant to shear. They also can't rotate in their holes. Yes. Because it's a square it's, peg in a round hole. Yeah. <laughs> and particularly if the hole's drilled a fraction smaller, then it's going to pin in on those four points, points as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to drill a quarter inch hole, which is the width of the rivet. Yes. And then, yeah, all four corners are going to cut their own channel as they yeah. go through and Excellent. then they'll get pinned on the inside. That sounds awesome. And the commercial rivets were, I want to say it was $7,000 to buy all of the commercial rivets. Yep. Or it was like sixteen hundred dollars wow. to buy the stock, or yeah. something crazy like that. Um, so when we looked at it, we bought the stock, not even being sure exactly how we were going to make the rivets. Yep. But we figured with a four thousand dollar budget, we, <laughs> we could do it. Figure out how to make them happen. I reckon you can make it happen too. Yeah, you, know, you pay for the press easily. Yeah. As a part of it. Even if we went to a professional machine shop right. and said, here's $3,000, make us a press yes. that can do this. Yeah. Or here's the stock, make the mm -hmm. rivets for us. Um, we figured that it would Which be you could always it. then sell on to a, a boat builder who's looking to start their project. Yeah. yeah. And for this, it works out that it takes about a right. minute a rivet. Right. Um, so if we were to sit up here for a 40 hour work week, mm -hmm. we should basically have enough rivets to do the entire To do the boat, boat. yeah. Um, and we've had volunteers have done a That's huge That's it, it's a job you them. could outsource as well. And then yeah. the other thing is, is we can probably make enough rivets to hang a plank in one evening. Yep. So worst case scenario, we get done with the end of the day. Yeah. One of us goes and makes dinner. The other one comes out here, cracks a beer, sits down heads up a bunch of rivets, yep. we come out after dinner, we point the rivets, yep. we have enough rivets to hang the plank the next day. Nice, yeah. um, so you so don't we have can to sit there for a week and drive yourself mad by exactly. doing every rivet. Yeah. And that's what we've been doing is we have a couple thousand done now and we haven't even started planking yet yeah. and we just keep picking away at it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, babe. <laughs> one of our, one of our uh, friends and followers nicknamed it Babe. Babe, oh, this is Babe, is babe the Motor. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if you know, there's a uh, Paul Bunyan. You ever heard that story? Of New England, there's right. Paul Bunyan, he's a giant lumberjack. Oh, okay, and his yeah, yeah. mascot is Babe the Blue Ox, which oh, is okay. like a giant blue ox. Giant blue ox, and <laughs> so, this is uh, here we go. Our blue diesel. That's nice, yeah. So, Nanny Diesel, how many horsepower? 47. 47, nice, perfect for a yacht like that. Chug yeah, along through the water, displacement hole. 40, right? So, this is just a little bit bigger. Uh, comes with the adjustable mounts already. This is something I've got to sort out for doing the alignment on the yep. gearbox. I unfortunately, I think I'm gonna, if I made some new brackets, I would have room for the mounts, but the current brackets come really low down like this. Oh, yeah. So there's no room for adjustable mounts. So I think it's gonna be easier to make new brackets than it is to do yeah. anything else. Very nice. Can't wait to get my engine back. To be honest with you, the, the best thing for me would have been to buy a new engine but because it's a yeah. restoration i felt that'd be cheating and then when we talked to john at hansen marine and brooke from nanny diesel mm -hmm. they were both willing to give us a bit of a break yes so nice. we were like do we spend four to six to rehab a 1980s diesel yep. or do we spend 10 and get a brand new diesel see i spent 10 to get a 1960s diesel so <laughs> yeah. yeah really <laughs> it's it's really a good deal the other yeah. thing too is like we've realized yeah. that Having the channel, we get a lot more help than other people do. And we have this yeah. friend, uh, Andrew, who's done a Mystic restoring mm -hmm. uh, boat called Rosalind. Mm -hmm. It's a 106 year old Cornish lugger. Oh, nice. Um, super cool project. Yeah. And he was like on a shoestring budget. Yeah, right. So we're like, eh, we can get a new diesel for ourselves. And we just gave him the old one. We gave yeah, nice. Yeah, and, that's yeah, that's cool. Right. Yeah, so this should be a great power plant for it. And yep. Once the planking's on, we'll drop the diesel in. Right. It's yep. going to be kind of obnoxious yep. to plank around, around the diesel. it. Yep. Yeah, see, this is the thing, because my engine's out at the moment, I've been madly, like, painting and grinding yeah, the engine back. everything you can back there. Yeah. Uh, so, a bit of electrical wiring and plumbing to go. Um, so, a lot of people are like, oh, why isn't your diesel back? Why is it taking so long? And the real answer is, I've been saying to them, no rush. No, no rush. Yeah. Like, I'm not, I'm not ready for it. Just yeah. keep it. I don't want to look after it. You look after it, yeah. you know. Yeah, sorry, Kelvin. <laughs> but, uh, it's like, you know, you really do. You're just sort of going, look. I just want to get everything out of the way because you can just squeeze past it. Like, yeah. you know, you literally, and I'm pretty thin, and it's like you can just squeeze in. Mm -hmm. So, everything I can do now. Yeah. It's for the best. And um, 
once you've got your deck on, will you be able to pull it out again? Not that you'll need to pull a new engine out in a great hurry, but um, or is it sort of one of those things you'll have to... Yeah, we've been talking about that a lot. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we learned a lot taking Victoria apart. Yes, I'm okay. I'm sure you learned yeah, a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. And one of the really big things we learned about Victoria is that there were a lot of things that had they been fixed, mm -hmm. she would have lasted a lot longer. Right. And they weren't okay. fixed because okay. to get to them was difficult. Right. So to get her engine out, you either need to pull the engine apart and yep. take it out through the companion way. Right, okay. Or you needed to take out her cockpit. Right. And to take out her cockpit means you basically had to destroy the cockpit. Cockpit, yeah. And same thing with the interior. The interior was all nailed and screwed and bunged together mm -hmm. and in such a manner that if you wanted access to the frames or behind the ceiling, you needed to go through and take everything apart. Well, and you mm. couldn't take it apart without really either being insanely meticulously yeah. careful. Mm -hmm. And even still probably damaging Things. a little bit. I, I mean, couldn't, I had some cabins that had been put in after the boat was built. I think it was built by someone who knew what they were doing, but then maybe some additions were somebody less experienced. And um, the cabin, I, I set fire to one of them because I was welding on the outside and, you know, oh, <laughs> anyway. But, um, but it actually was a welded frame and then screw, timber screwed in and then uh, plywood facing glued on the top of the heads of the screws. Yeah. So it's just physically impossible. Like a, a sawzall and a, and a crowbar were the only way to take it out. Yeah. Yeah. And if a leak had come from behind there, which is the same yeah. with a, a friend's boat in Sydney, timber trawler, um, he's got a leak that, uh, you know, it's like 20 litres an hour. It's not, you know, it adds up 10 hours, 200 litres in your build. Yeah, yeah. On board. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but it's completely behind a brine tank you can't sort of remove. And so access to the hull, I think, is critical. Oh, yes. absolutely. Yeah. And that's something that we're, was like very apparent after mm -hmm. taking Victoria apart. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we're really, really trying to think. Mm -hmm. Through. 50 moves ahead. Yes, yep. And like, the ultimate right. chess players. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Someday down the road, yeah. when we have to take the diesel out, mm -hmm. how is this going to go? How's it going to happen? And yep. really trying to make sure that we spend a bit of time now so that we or don't repair have to the spend bilge under the engine. You know, I can't. Yeah. You know, that was my thing. I couldn't physically fit my hand under the engine. Yeah. There's no way I could even wipe the bilge with the engine in place. And that was part of our logic of the bronze floors, is that when we did the um, ones for the engine beds, mm -hmm. they have those huge cutouts in them. Yep. So even we put this diesel in here and you'll be able to just reach right. all the way right. underneath. Excellent. And, Perfect. And yeah, and be able to wipe, be able yeah. to collect things. There was stuff under Victoria's diesel that I think had been there since oh. that diesel was installed. I found three spanners underneath yeah, exactly. my Exactly, yeah. yeah. Spanner yeah. sockets, yeah, yeah. Uh, hose clamps, pieces yeah. of hose, That's and they were like in this much shit. Yes, yeah. oily water, oily just, water and yeah. grunge and yeah. rust, and it was just this big block, and you started to peel it apart and break yeah. it, and you're finding all these things, and it was because the way that her floor timbers were set up in the yeah. engine beds, yeah. is there was one bay under there, yeah. you just you couldn't get to. Couldn't get to it, yeah. By getting Victoria, we paid maybe three thousand dollars for her, mm -hmm. all said and done, between buying her and trucking her. Yep. And we probably got. Fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars worth, worth of, of hardware, hardware and materials yeah. off of her. I mean, we have a ton of mahogany. We have all the bronze. We have the brass. We have her spars. Wow. Goodbye. We, yeah, I mean, in incredible. No, so that's we're gonna great. we'll clean them up and we'll see what we can do with them. Yep. Um, oh, I haven't introduced Dad yet. This is Dad, Bruce. This is my dad. He's come <laughs> with me to the US. But I'm going to ask you two the one question that they all hate to be asked, and you know what it is, don't you? When are we going to be done? Yep. <laughs> Standard answer is two to Good. ten years. Two to ten. Probably yep. won't be two. Probably yeah. won't be ten. Yeah. 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 Well, I think mine was. Uh, Mine was always four weeks, from the start to the four, to, to, to the oh, end. Exactly, oh, yeah. two years. Yeah, exactly. And he'll launch two years. Yeah, when you ask me, it's always going to be two years. Yeah, cool. Yeah, we had a target to go to uh, Nora Head. Yes, for a family reunion around Easter yeah. or something. And yeah. <laughs> now it's uh, four weeks what's out from when you go. Yeah. Well, what is it they say about boats? You don't have schedules, you have destinations. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of the same yeah, like thing that. with the build. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> I love the look of the. Uh, there's something to me about the marriage of steel and timber. It's a really nice combination. Yeah, fire. Yeah, essentially, it's just a big wood stove. Mm -hmm. So, let a big rip roar on fire in there. Yep. And then this holds about 50 gallons of water. Yep. And then that is connected to this box. So, we just stick them in there, and then this is the hole. 
It goes down in and just mm -hmm. fills up with steam and yep. fills the box. And none of the bending happens until after they're out. They're just steamed and yep. then bent. And then you just have a couple minutes. Yeah. Right. So it's before really, you've got to really get them out quick. quick. Process. Okay. Yeah. So we open up this wall here. Ah, uh, give yourself direct just, access. Yeah. And bring them right in. Yep. Nice. And then that's yeah. our big cedar rack. It's <laughs> all our planking well, yeah. stuck. Yeah, that's good. A lot of timbers don't like being stacked this way. They'll warp and do stuff, but mm -hmm. apparently cedar, it doesn't really bother it. And as we go to pick planks, we can just kind of flip through it like a big book. Yeah, that's full for the planks. Yep. <laughs> that's awesome. You have to pan up to see the top. You can't yeah. even <laughs> need the wide, wide angle GoPro. And this is all timber from your local area. Yep. Yeah, so this all came from out in eastern Massachusetts, maybe an hour drives from here, hour yep. and a half drive. Yeah, nice. So we had mentioned in one of the videos that we would love cedar planking and we didn't have cedar planking. Yeah. And this guy emailed us and he was like, hey, I own six acres and guess what? Most of it's covered in big white cedars. <laughs> if you want to come harvest some, you can. Wow, that's great. So we went out and spent three days in the middle of winter and cut 30 or so cedar trees and wow. piled up the logs and then hired a log truck to yeah. truck them from here, from there to here. And then we milled them. Oh, that's awesome. But, I mean, we got all the cedar for a couple thousand dollars between trucking and milling. Yep. Yeah. Which, and a little bit of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to start cutting down my own steel, I think. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Go dig the ore out. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the vid. If you did, be sure to subscribe to Acorn to Arabella. They're filming, you know, every week showing various parts of the process and it's really interesting to see. I'm in Chicago at the moment, uh, as you can see in the background, just got back from a Cubs game. And on Monday, I'm going to be hiring a car and driving down Route 66 towards LA. On the way, we're going to be going through Tulsa to see Doug from SV Seeker. While we're there, we're going to be having a meetup for both channels. So that'll be on Saturday the 21st between one and four in the afternoon. So if you can make that, that'd be awesome. All right, well, take care and I might see you there. Bye.